Namaskar viewers, I welcome you to this fourth lecture on the series on engineering psychology. The last lecture was dedicated in understanding research methods engineering psychology and in that lecture we discussed scientific method, how to explain the scientific method and what are the basics of scientific method. We also looked at how research is done and for doing research how problems are found out. Once you have a problem, how we look into the literature and based on the theories in literature, we propose hypotheses which can be tested. So, we looked at different types of hypothesis and understood the nature of hypothesis. We also discussed the difference between basic and applied research and we continued with the concepts in research where we looked at what is the difference between a study and a experiment and how study experiments and quasi experiments are different. Continuing from the last lecture, today we will understand the process of doing research in a little bit more detail. So, whenever we do research, we find it a problem and then design a method to test this problem. I will borrow the ex experiment that I defined in the last class where we are looking at whether driving and diversion of attention during driving in terms of working with the cell phone can cause accidents. We, we are proposing to find out if there are solutions which car manufacturers can give so that momentary shifts in attention can be covered by the car software. So, that was the problem and we proposed several intuitive solutions and some hypotheses which we wanted to test. Now, when we are testing this hypothesis against a problem statement, we should be wary that this problem could occur to a lot of people. What I mean here is that when we talk about drivers and how their attention shifts, we are talking about a number of drivers and this whole category of drivers which would include men, women, which could include people of different countries, people of different nationalities, different age groups, different trainings, different education and so all those people who fall into this driving category is called the population. So, population is a group of people who has that characteristic aspect that we are testing. By definition, population is the large group of individuals we attempt to understand in research. One problem with most studies is that we cannot include all people within the population. In our driving example, we cannot test every driver on this earth or even in a particular city in terms of how they behave when they are driving and they are paying attention to the cell phone. And that leads to a problem with population and that is that the population has a large number of people within it. And so, we cannot test everyone in a population. This is one difficulty with a population. Populations are both defined and undefined. Defined populations are still good because we know how many people can drive, but undefined population is where we do not know how people, how many people are actually driving. A quick look at the DMV database will tell you how many drivers have issued license 
and that can give you an idea about how many drivers could be there in a city. But we all know that people drive without licenses and so this then comprises of the undefined population. So, very brief words all those people of interest that we want to test our problem on comprises of the population. Now, since we cannot test everyone in a population, we do the next best thing and that is finding a representative sample from the population. What is a sample? A sample consists of a group of people which are randomly picked from the population and which we believe will have properties of the population. This basically translates to the fact that within the population we will have varied kind of individuals, different nationalities, different education, different ages, different gender and we believe that by using the random method of taking out a sample we will have some people from each of this category and then we can test these samples against the hypothesis and look for solutions. So, sample then is a subset of the population which researchers believe comprises of most of the parameters of the population. Parameter is the feature of the population. So, then let us define sample then. So, researchers collect information from a group of participants which is called sample to study and make inferences about the population this is what I was saying. So, let us say if I have a population of 10,000 drivers in a city and within this 10,000 drivers I will have women, men, people of different ages, people of different nationalities, people of different uh, caste, people of uh, different learning in terms of education. So, what I will do is I will take a random sample. I will randomly pick people from this 10,000 people who comprise the population and then from these random people I will then assume that they will have all features of the population meaning which the sample will comprise of genders different genders different education levels, different age groups and this kind of properties. Now, samples are representative of the population they represent. As I just discussed, when I take a sample from a population, I assume that everyone in the population is represented in the sample or at least everyone in the population has an equal chance of being represented in a population. And how do I assure that everyone in the population has an equal chance of being represented in a sample? I use something called random sampling, which means that I pick up people randomly from the uh, population into the sample. And this is how I will make sure that my sample is representative of the population. We study the sample to generalize finding to the population. The results of the sample will be generalized to the population meaning which since we believe that the sample represents the population whatever results we get for the sample those should be holding true for the population. An example would be that if we find that providing tactile input vibrations in the steering to denote accidents and this method works in our sample 
we will generalize this to the population meaning which that in general for most drivers in the city this feedback from the steering wheel is actually going to help you in driving. Now, number of sampling methods are used to select samples. So, how do we do sampling? One method I just explained to you is called random sampling in which we take people randomly from the population and then use as a sample. But are there other methods? What about those situations in which the different types of people within the population are not equal? We may have unequal distribution and of men and women. We may have unequal distribution of different educated people in this uh, population. So, how do we make sure that the sample is representative meaning which the sample represents is a good approximation of the population. So, let us discuss some sampling methods of taking people from the population so that they represent the population and the generalizability of the result from the sample to the population becomes easy. The first method is called a random sampling method. Here the assumption that researchers have while collecting a sample is that everyone in the population has an opportunity to participate. Now, since we are taking people randomly from the population, everyone gets a probability of being selected. Meaning which if I do multiple samplings, if I collect multiple data or multiple samples from the population, then in these multiple samples everyone will be represented. So, for explanation purposes, if I have 100 people as a population and I have a sample of 10, I can randomly select the first, fifth, eighth, twentieth, fortieth, forty seventh that kind of people in the first sample. If I then again take a sample, it may be possible that the people that I took in the first case may not come in the second sample and other people may come. And in this way, if I take 10 different samples, the chances are that most of the people within the sample from 1 to 100 will fall in our different samples. So, the population has 100 people and these 10 different samples that I have taken will then have every probability that from 1 to 100 people in the population fall in this sample. So, this is the assumption of equal probability. Now, random sampling is generally not feasible. There are many reasons. One reason could be that a population may seem homogeneous, but it is not, which means that different features of the population different categories within the population are not equally distributed. We would have more males than females. Also in those times when we do not have a defined population, finding the probability for each person is difficult because we do not know how many people are there. So, other reasons could also be there. And these could lead us to use a different sampling method. In cases where we have different amounts of people within the population, an inequality between the number of males and females, the number of educated versus non-educated, the number of different castes of people, the differ uh, differently trained people within the population. What we do is, we use a stratified sampling. In a stratified sampling, what we do is first, we make different stratas. So, we will divide the population according to the feature that is of interest to us. For example, let us say education. So, we will divide the population in terms of different education classes. 
those who are educated till fifth class, those who are educated from fifth onwards to tenth class, those who are having high school degree, those who are having higher degrees and so on. This is how we will divide the population. Then we will collect people from these different categories in some proportion, so that equal number of people from these dif different categories are selected. So, let us say we have 10 people who are educated till class 10th and there are 30 people who are educated till class 5th. So, 30 and 10 is 40 and the rest 100 the 60 people have graduate degree. So, when we take up a sample from these different stratas, we will have to attach a weight. So, we will find some proportion as in taking one people from the 5th class to 10th class or till 10th class educated has to be equated in terms of 30 people who are having class 5 degree and 60 people who are having the graduate degree and in this way we will equate we will find some kind of a ratio and we will have equal kind of people. Then what we will do is within the strata that is 30 people who have education till class 5 we will randomly select from that 30 people. So, each person selected from the middle category which is people having education till class 10 and there are 10 people there. So, one per person who is selected every person who is selected from this category against that we will have 3 people from the category of people who have education till 5th class and 6 people who will have category who will have education till graduates and within this 6 people and 3 people that we are picking we will have to pick it randomly and that is how stratified random sampling is done. So, we will make different stratas and from these different stratas we will pick people in equal ratios and then within the ratio of people we will randomly select people. So, within the strata we will randomly select people and this is called stratified random sampling. So, sam sample individuals from different subgroups. We can also use something called a cohort sampling design in which one group is studied over a period of time. So, instead of taking different people and testing them, we can take one individual and study him from 5 or 10 years. This is called cohort sampling and in this case what will happen is they will have the same history because it is the same person who is being studied all along for that 5 or 10 years. And the last kind of sampling that generally used is called the convenience sampler where anybody or every, any everybody who is available for doing our study will pick them. So, random sampling may not be feasible and stratified sampling may not be feasible because of reasons of not knowing what the samples are or not knowing the composition of the population. In those cases what we do is whoever is available we take them and that is called convenience sample and this is how sampling is done or a sample is created from the population. Once we have collected people from the population through a sample the next thing that we should think about doing is assigning these people to different groups in a random fashion. We can use a coin flip or a lottery. So, let us say that from 10,000 people we have taken 1000 people as a sample. Now, these 1000 people not needs to be divided into two categories. One which get a tactile feedback from the car steering, the second group which gets an audio feedback or we could test it in terms of one group which is getting a tactile feedback feedback and the second group which is not getting any feedback at all and see how they differ in terms of 
driving performances in those situations where we can put our attention onto the cell phone. These are those situations which are emergency situations, right. So, random assignment makes it sure that you are selecting the people randomly and also selecting the conditions of the experiment randomly. A third thing that needs to be discussed here is called an effect size. What is an effect size? Now, it may so happen that you have two different groups. The experimental group is one which is getting feedback from the car steering and the control group is that which is not getting any feedback and we are testing whether these different groups have any differences in terms of performances while driving. Now, we can test these three groups under different driving conditions, high load driving condition and low load driving conditions or normal driving conditions. What effect size basically means is that if we believe by reading the literature that different driving conditions may affect how accidents are caused irrespective of whether they are getting feedback from the car steering or no feedback, then we can take a very small sample because we know that these conditions differ and they can be one of the important factors in deciding the result. So, what effect size mean, means is how effective would we believe that our experiment would be successful, that the design that we have created would be successful. So, how many people to include in a sample is determined by something called effect size. How much should be the sample size? This is what effect size is. Now, if we believe that conditions under which the experiment is run have very less effect size, they are not two different from each other, we will have to take larger samples. But if conditions are different within which the experiment is run, in those cases we will can still take a small sample. So, an effect size is essentially the impact of manipulation. How much will we believe that changing the kind of feedback that we get from the car handle has any effect on driving performance. If we believe that a large impact will be possible, we can take smaller samples, but if we believe that this impact will be less, a large sample is required. Now, if the expected effect size is large, one can use smaller samples as I just discussed, but with larger sample sizes, even smaller effects will become significant. So, if you have a very large sample size, in the, those cases even if the difference between the control and the experimental condition is small, just because of the number of people that you have taken and the kind of statistics that you have applied, you may get a good result, a significant result. So, we should design our research to recruit the fewest number of participants, but large enough effect size. While designing experiments, we should be sure that we should not take a large number of people because it is a play with statistics. The more number of people that you take, the more significant your result will become. So, we should take optimal level of people and decide how much effective our experiment is. A medical effect size is of 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 a lower effect size is of 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 and anything above 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 or 8 is a high effect size. These vary. So, sometimes we take 0 0.4 to 0, uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.4 as medio core and 0 0.4 to 0 0.6 as high effect size, which means that 60 percent of the time or 60 percent of the variation in the data can be explained by the change that we have done or the new design that we have used. So, this is basically what is effect size. Now, for finding 
how much sample should we use? We can also use something called power analysis and in power analysis what we do is we look at literature and see what different experiments have done and how much they have been successful in terms of effect size, how much effect or how much impact of manipulation they have found and based on that if we find the effect size and the significance level which is how many times do we believe that an effect is happening because of chance are we going to accept our result we can plug this into a formula and based on that we can calculate the sample size ok. Next thing that we use in research is the idea of variables. Now, there are different kind of variables we use in research. There is something called an independent variable and there is something called a dependent variable. Independent variables are sometimes called the predictor variable and dependent variable are sometimes called as the criterion variable. What is the independent variable? That variable which we change which the experimental has control on. So, what kind of feedback that you get from the software is an independent variable. You can get a tactile feedback, you can get an auditory feedback or you can get no feedback at all from the car software system or the car itself. This is independent variable and how this feedback gets translated into not doing accidents or escaping from accidents in terms of your performance is basically the dependent variable. So, change the feedback from the car and see how the driver performance is and this driver performance is evaluated in terms of how accurate did they avoid an accident situation. So, independent variables are those which can be manipulated in an experiment as I said independent variables are also called predictor variables and these are the variables which the experimenter has full control on. Examples of independent variable are colors of the environment blue, yellow, green, white or it could be in terms of what feedback you are getting from the car software or it could be in terms of what teaching method a teacher uses to teach a class. And by changing the independent variable, what we want to measure is what changes have occurred in behavior of the individuals. So, change in independent variable will cause a change in the behavior of people which can be measured in some way or through some criteria. And this change which is measured through a criteria is called the dependent variable. So, changes in independent variable leads to change in dependent variable and we believe that this behavior change in the subject which is measured through a behavior or a criteria is called measuring the dependent variable. So, dependent variables are called outcome variables because they are an outcome of the changes which has been done on the independent variable. Dependent variables are the direct result of changes in the independent variable and an examples of dependent variable could be performance, could be mood, could be reaction time. It is very essential to define how we measure the dependent variable. For example, performance. So, if we change the color of the environment, how does performance change? Take some workers, make them work in different colored rooms and see how their performance change. Now, when I say performance, it is not measurable. So, we need to define what is performance and in terms of measuring it, we can define performance in as how many units of a particular work somebody has finished or how accurate they are in doing a job or how fast they can do a job. So, whether using different colors increases performance in terms of productivity or in terms of quicker work that is how 
dependent variables are measured. Mood co uh, could also be measured in terms of good or bad. So, whether color of the environment changes people's mood because these moods will get translated into performance. So, this is how independent variables and dependent variables are defined. We could also have a covariate. Sometimes it happens that independent variables do not directly affect dependent variables, but through a intermediate variable which is called a covariate. A value that is associated with the independent variable and this is con continuous in nature. So, it may so happen that colors change performance, but they are not doing it directly. Colors leads to change in mood and this change in mood leads to performance or colors lead to some other aspect. For example, colors affect personality and personality leads to change in performance. So, if you have more extrovert people, for them colors would get better performances, but if you have introvert people, the same change in color will not give you any change in performance. And so, personality here is a covariate, it is not evident, it is not showing up as such, but what is happening is that colors are affecting performances, but only for some group of people it is controlled by a hidden factor or an intermediate factor which is called personality. So, this is what a covariate is all about and it should be in continuous form. Now, as I described before, dependent variables are measured in terms of a criteria. So, what is a criteria? A criteria is the standard. Performance is measured through a criteria which is in terms of how many units of work you have done or how accurate you are. These measures of the outcome variable are called the criteria. There is something called a third variable problem, an unknown variable that could be the cause of the result. In some cases, some hidden variable could be causing the effect that you are getting in a experiment and you may not be aware of this hidden variable. This is called a third variable problem. For example, it could be that we never looked at intelligence of people and intelligence relates to motor skills. So, more intelligent a person is, he can avoid accidents even without that feedback from the car steering system. And so, this hidden variable of intelligence or intelligence in term relating to motor movements is something which we did not consider in our experiment and so this could be a third variable problem in this way. Another important definition is operationalization of the variable. Now, in behavioral sciences variables can have many meanings. For example, I want to define happiness. So, how do I define happiness? Happiness could be elation, happiness could be the feeling of goodness that you get when you get some kind of a reward or it could be described in some other terms, change in facial features, change in physiological features, change in behavior patterns, anything. So, while defining happiness, I have to be specific as in what aspect of behavior are uh, we looking at? What is it that I am targeting in the behavior as a measure of happiness? I could be targeting physiological changes or I could be targeting some other aspect facial effect, personality changes or some other thing. So, this is operationalization. Operationalization means that this is the definition of happiness that I have for this experiment and only within this definition will the results of my experiment work. If you try to define happiness or measure happiness in a different way, then the results that I get from an experiment on happiness is not going to work and this is called operationalization. So, operationalization involves describing variables in concrete term, so it is clearly understood. As I discussed before, I have to be giving you a measure of how it something is measured, happiness in terms of physiology, happiness in terms of personality, happiness in terms of some other factor, right. So, what is the factor? 
the variable should be defined in measurable terms. Also, when I say physiology, it could be in terms of GSR responses, it could be in terms of arousal levels. So, what is it that I am measuring? A bad example is performance, best performance in a race. Now, when I am defining a variable as best performance in a race, what do I mean? How is this best performance rated? Whether it is in terms of timing, whether it is in terms of number of errors, whether it is termed in some other aspect. A good example of operationalization is defining performance in the lowest time to reach the finish line in a race. Now, I have defined in terms of time, how much time somebody is taking and so here the operationalization is good. Now, the variables in a scientific research should also have something called reliability and validity. So, what is reliability and validity? Reliability refers to something called consistency. Reliability does not necessarily mean the same results, but it means that there is a consistency. Let us uh, say that I take the driving test and in that test I perform in terms of number of errors. Now, if the test is given to me again and assuming that I have not taken any driving lesson and I perform the same way in the second test or get scores similar to what I get in the first test, this driving test is reliable. Reliability means that getting similar scores on multiple testings across time. So, recording similar times in driving test. This is an example. So, if I have a driving test and if I have not taken any driving lessons and if I am getting the same score across different demonstrations of this test, then the test is said to be reliable because I am getting more or less the same or similar results. Validity on the other hand assesses the measure is truly measuring or tapping what you want to measure. Validity also suggests prediction of other outcomes or criteria. What validity means that the test measures what it is supposed to measure. So, I have a driving test and it has questions related to personality. It has questions which are not measuring driving. It is asking me questions like how do you feel today or how many people in your home knows driving. Now, these type of questions are not related to driving rather the test should ask me questions related to how do you avoid certain situations in driving or some questions related to how do you know the layout of a vehicle. So, these questions will relate to driving, but questions like whether somebody knows driving in your home or not does not actually tap into the driving skill and so it will not be valid. But questions like whether you know the arrangement of the vehicle in terms of its control or whether you can avoid a certain situation which can cause accident while driving these type of questions are related to driving and so it is a valid test. Now, a good example of validity is personality test cannot measure reaction time. If you are looking at personality tests, they are going to measure only personality and not reaction times or will not tell you how fast somebody is. Now, how do we measure reliability? The measure of reliability can be done in two ways. There are a number of other ways, but there are two mainly used ways that I am going to define. One is called the test retest form. Here, the same group of subjects are tested under two different points of time on the same test and if they get similar results, this is called test retest. So, I test once, I retest once and I keep on testing 2, 3, 4 times at different time points, the same sample of people with the same test and if I get similar results across all these testings, it is called reliable through the test retest method. There is also something called the inter rate reliability in which different people who are experts in their field are called and they are asked to raise a performance of a sample of people. And if these mean of these ratings are taken across different performances and the ratings of different raters agree, we say that this is called inter rater reliability. Beauty contest, different people are called and they judge beauty of participants. And if 
they give a score to a certain individual and this score is similar for 3 or 4 raters for a particular individual this is said to have inter rater reliability. One major problem that can happen here is that two raters may not interpret the same situation similarly. So, people have different idea about beauty and so the same candidate may be rated differently by different raters on a particular aspect of beauty. So, this is one problem. Now, validity generally are of four types. I will very briefly define these four types of validity. The first kind of validity is called the face validity. In face validity, tests which appear to measure something intuitively also seems to be measuring the same thing. What do I mean? Tools having face validity appear to be appropriate for the validity being assessed. For example, driving and talking on the cell phone is an appropriate measure to assess the impact of cell phone on driving. Because if I put people in a driving simulator and give them a phone to talk to while driving, on the face of it, it seems a good way to measure how cell phones affect driving. So, this has face validity. Tools which have face validity seem to be appropriate to be used in a particular experiment or for measuring a particular effect. The second kind of validity is called the content validity. This does not require any calculation, but depends on experts opinion. When I say that a particular tool has a content validity, which means that that tool taps onto the content which is being measured. So, from testing introverts versus extroverts and I make a questionnaire for that, the properties of a person who is an extrovert and the properties of a person who is an introvert are first recorded and then experts are called in who will then take the tool and see whether the questions in the tool matches what should be the part of an extrovert or an introvert person and this is called content validity. So, by definition how do extroverts and introverts differ? This can only be expressed through or understood by a subject matter expert. And if he takes your tool and then compares it with what should be the features of an extrovert and introvert and if they match then your tool has supposed to be having content validity. A third kind of validity is called the criteria related validity and what does it mean? Objective is to determine how well the measurement tool relates to some criteria measure. So, let us say that there is some criteria that I have set and if my tool measures that criteria well, then I will say that my tool has criteria validity. Let us take an example. For example, I try to see how different colors affect mood. So, I will give different colors and see how people's mood are varied, but the problem is how do we then measure mood? What is the criteria of measurement of mood. Good mood is generally translated in terms of criteria of being happy and bad mood is translated in terms of a criteria being sad. So, when people are in a good mood they are happy and people are in a sad mood they are uh, bad mood they are sad. So, the scale of measurement of mood is in terms of good relates to happy and bad relates to sad. And if this is the scale that we use to represent changes in mood by using color, this tool is supposed to have criteria validity. So, by showing different colors, if people become happy, we can translate this as in terms of having good mood, but by showing certain color, if somebody becomes sad, I can say that this person has a bad mood or he is not in a good mood and this is how translations are done. 
this kind of validity is also called predictive validity where it helps in predicting what kind of changes will happen by using a particular tool. And the last kind of validity that we have is called a construct validity which refers to whether the tool relates to a known construct as personality. For example, what is a construct? A construct is a hypothetical way of explaining a particular behavior or a outcome and these are created in behavioral sciences. So, suppose I know that openness to color whether you like color or not is related to personality as I just discussed people who are introvert will not like changes in color, but people who are extroverts will like changes in color. Now, how do I measure whether people like color or not or what is the relation of openness to color to mood or some other factor. What I could do is measure people's personality and then translate it back to how open they are into choosing color. As we know that people who are more open to color are known to be introvert, extrovert and people who are close to color are known to be introvert. This is a personality measure. So, what we could do is we can take a scale of personality which measures extrovert and introvert, give it to people who are taking this experiment on openness to color and by measuring the personality we can then predict that if somebody is an extrovert or somebody shows an extrovert personality he will be more open to color. So, in construct validity what we tend to do is we look at a construct which is related to the idea that we are measuring and then test the tool against that particular construct. This is construct validity. Now, assuming that the tools that we have used is valid and reliable, we have collected a sample from the population and we have proposed hypothesis and also defined a problem. The next thing is doing statistical analysis which can be done through both descriptive and inferential methods. Now, what is the descriptive method of analyzing data? In descriptive method of analyzing data, what we tend to do is we take some data and we try to describe it. For example, through descriptive method, we try to represent the data and then compare two groups based on these representation. So, let us say that we have collected data in terms of performance on this driving test. So, we had two groups the experimental group which received some kind of feedback from the vehicle support system and the control group which did not and we were measuring performance in terms of how accurately they can come out of an accident situation or how accurately they can navigate. So, we collect data from a sample of people and then we make some kind of chart in terms of people who had got feedback versus non feedback and based on that if we are doing the comparison simply in terms of how many people have behaved in the control group and the experimental group this is called descriptive methods or doing research. In descriptive method, it involves collecting data that identify and define the situations and can be used to make predictions. So, we collect data, represent it in some, some way and from there we try to make inferences or define situations. We do not do any statistical analysis depth related statistical analysis or we do not infer anything from it, we are just describing data, we do not try to extract some results from that data and this kind of method of analyzing data is called descriptive. Here questions like how many, how much and how often something is happening can be answered. So, basically descriptive statistics 
would be related to answering questions of how many times something has happened, how often does it happen, how many people have had this experience and these kind of answers to questions. The main kind of statistics that we use in the descriptive method is the mean, median and mode. The mean is the center of a data, the median is the exact half point and the mode is the most frequently occurring, occurring value in a set of data. So, these are the statistics that we use in descriptive method and the techniques that we use in descriptive methods is called observation where we observe a particular group of people performing in different situations, content analysis in which people's explanation are written first and then some themes are extracted. For example, you can ask people to describe how was their experience in the experimental group versus the control group. They will write a sentence and from that sentence we have to pick up themes and these themes are then later on analyzed. We can do a review of records as in secondary data analysis and we can also use surveys and questionnaires for doing descriptive research. In the inferential method, the means of interpreting data or understanding why something is happening is the core of it. So, in this descriptive method we just describe data, in inferential methods we infer or we sort of extract results and hypothesize or predict certain kind of reasons for the result or make predictions as to why something is happening. So, this why is the basis of inferential methods. It inferential methods try to explain relationships in terms of cause effect as in if I give tactile feedback people will perform better. But if I do not give tactile feedback, people will perform worse. If I give auditory feedback, people will perform worse. But if I do not give auditory feedback, people will perform normally. And then comparing the three groups together saying that the best is uh, the tactile feedback, the worst is auditory feedback and no feedback is still good. The kind of statistics that we use in inferential method is regression and analysis of variance. What do regressions do? In regression we try to fit a line of best fit, a line which explains any deviation in data. When we collect a data there is a independent variable which is plotted on the x axis and there is a dependent variable which is plotted on the y axis. And if we plot the data as a scatter diagram it will be all over the place. So, people will have different responses for different changes in uh, the independent variable or the predictor variable. This regression line tries to explain most of the deviations or most of the data points and through this equation most of the variance in the data can be explained. So, regression lines are the best fit lines which try to explain most of the people's behavior in terms of the predictor and outcome variable. Analysis of variance is analyzing variance or change changes in performances by using either a t-test or a f-test. The techniques that we use in inferential methods is using the experimental method. In the experimental method we create a experimental group and a control group. An experimental group is where the manipulation of variables will happen and the control group is where there is no manipulation of variable and the kind of design that we can use is a within subject design, a between subject design and a mixed design. In a between subject design, we will use two different sample of people in the experimental and the control group. In the within subject design, we will use the same group of people, the same sample of people under both the experimental conditions and the control conditions and in mixed design we can have both different groups of people and the same group of people under different conditions. So, under one level for example, testing reaction times 
in terms of driving performances we can have two different groups of people but if you are looking at errors we can use the same group of people under two different conditions so mixed designs are basically a mixture of both within and between subject designs in experimental and control groups experimental group test for something called the main effect which is the effect of interest for example in our driving situation whether tactile feedback is better than no feedback is the main effect and interaction effect is it may so happen that under certain conditions of the road for example in low driving conditions tactile feedback is good but in high driving condition it is as bad as no feedback and so these are called the interaction effect if more than one factor is involved designs types of design i have just discussed between subject using two different groups of people within subject using same group of people and mixed design using a combination of these two in experimental methods we can use something called counterbalancing in counterbalancing what we do is for some people in the experimental group we will first give the control condition and then the experimental condition but in for the second person we will start with the experimental condition first and the control condition second let's say that we have two variables one different kind of accident situations low medium and high and we have the experimental group having the new design and control group having no design as such or no feedback as, as such now counter counterbalance means that for some candidate will start with the low accident condition and start in the experimental group and then proceed to the medium and the worst accident condition cases or uh, worst uh, accident situations but for the, some other candidate will start with the mediocre first then go to the uh, worst and then go to the least this kind of a thing so changing the conditions this is called counterbalancing and it offsets the order effects of manipulation if we do that what will happen is people will not become habitual as in if they if you always start with the lowest condition to the mediocre condition to the fast condition people become habituated to break this habit to break this prediction on the part of the participant we use randomized methods or we randomize the uh, different conditions confounding confounding can happen when a systematic change in another variable along with a change in independent variable it may so happen that a third variable of interest may also get affected and that could be the reason of the result as we talked about intelligence and that could be what is confounding the next thing that we want to do is so we have results now so we had a problem we set up the hypothesis we set up the experimental methods and from there we collected data and then now we come to generalization so what is generalization testing for external validity generalization is taking your results for the sample and then putting it on the population testing it for the population or saying something from the population based on the results that you have from the sample now generalization of results suffers from something called testing of external validity sample is less diverse than population let's say that i have a population of only young people in my driving experiment and i found that changes in uh, feedback leads to better performance but this is only for younger people and if i take this result and put it to the whole population saying that everybody who is driving actually will benefit from this kind of feedback or variation this may not be true because it will suffer from something called external validity i have tested on only young people and it is valid in the population also only for young people the results of our experiment it may not work for young drivers or some other kind of drivers and for that solving this problem we have to do something called multiple operationalization of variables which means that we have to operationalize our variable in different ways we have to give different definitions of the variable generalization also requires something called testing for internal validity which means that the measures and procedures are reliable and valid so we have to see that subjective biases don't creep in subject doesn't get biased in terms of giving his result experimenters bias as in experimenters own belief and expectations doesn't creep in in uh, terms of generalization so i may get some result from the sample but the experimenter thinks that this 
could also be included or this kind of interpretation uh, can be done and if it does that and then applies this result to the population is not going to work. So, whatever we get from the sample has to be explained in clear concise way on the population and that is uh, reducing the experimenter bias or experimenters belief should not suffer the results from the sample and demand characteristics certain type of test require certain kind of demand characteristics. If you are taking a test of memory, demand characteristics suggest that a recall will follow, right? because nobody gives you a list to remember just like that. So, the demand characteristics of the experiment, which is the requirement of the experiment says that if you are learning a list, then later on you will be asked to retrieve the list back and this is called the demand characteristics and so this could be this should be minimized. The last section is ethics. So, while doing experiments, some ethics should be followed. The first is conflict of interest. It should be seen that there should be no conflict of interest between the experimenter and the subject. No obligation to one or more party. Nuremberg code should be followed. Here, the influence process in research and must have informed consent and uh, the right to withdraw. So, subjects should be given the right to withdraw and they should be given informed consent as in they should consent to the experiment. And Nuremberg code is basically coming from the Nuremberg trials which happened uh, after World War II and so a set of rules were prepared saying that how should experiments be done on uh, human participants and this implied that everybody has rights and so they should be allowed to withdraw from experiments whenever they want and they should be informed beforehand before an experiment. So, this is called the Nuremberg code. Belmont principles should also be followed. It would uh, it demonstrates respect of participants and protects participants rights. In Belmont principle what happened is certain group of back people were had syphilis and they were not told that they were had syphilis and not even given penicillin to uh, treat syphilis just because they wanted to study how syphilis progresses. Now, this kind of thing is prohibited by Belmont principle it says that everybody has rights and this participants rights should be protected. So, before starting an experiment or before uh, starting any kind of research, informed consent should be taken, people should be informed, participants should be informed what their rights are, uh, what they can do, what is being measured and how it is being measured. Some level of deception is allowed, but this is uh, what is informed consent and they have to voluntarily get into your experiment. Risk benefit ratio, all risk related to the experiment and all benefits that people are getting from the experiment should be explained. So, risk related to everyday activities and minimization of risk should be done. So, it should be uh, experiment should be designed in such a way that minimum risk happens. Deception and debriefing should be used. So, after the experiment the subject should be debriefed as in this was what was collected, this was the true nature of the experiment, this is what we uh, the results are and this is how you perform. And institutional review boards should be constituted which can direct how experiment should be conducted or which should which can lay out rules of how experiment should be conducted. So, in detail what we covered in this lecture and the last lecture tries to explain you the basis of doing research and how research is done in behavioral sciences in the larger domain and engineering psychology for this course. So, when we meet next I will be taking up more interesting topics in engineering psychology, but for today it is thank you and namaskar from the MOOCs studio. Mm -hmm.